At DLGS, he served as deputy director for 14 years and periodically as acting director. He has broad experience in many areas of local government policy administration, including specific ex expertise in areas such as finance and property taxation, public procurement, shared services and consolidation, technology, energy, labor relations, and general government administration. He also has deep experience in the legislative process as and as a regulatory officer. He is currently engaged in research concerning the use of technology in local government. Please join me in welcoming Mark Pfeiffer. Thank you, Leslie. Good morning, everybody. I need to do a quick technology thing here. Just forgive me, and we'll get this show on the road. Come on. There we go. Okay, good morning. So, I am really happy to be here. I am not a stranger to San Diego and La Jolla. My family lives here. Uh, this is my first um, national, as it were, technology keynote, or keynote of any type. Most of my speaking, they keep me locked in New Jersey, and I don't speak out of the state very often, so it's really interesting for me to be here. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, but then again, uh, this is your first time appearing before me, so you guys shouldn't be so nervous either. Uh, and before I start, I want to introduce somebody who's now going to be really annoyed at me, but I want to introduce my 88-year-old mother, who is this lovely woman sitting down here. So say hi to Bobby. <laughs> She's, uh, she, she escaped from New Jersey in 1976 and has had a wonderful life here, and I'm kind of glad that I, you guys were here because it enabled me to, to do a trip to her and visit and see you guys, so it'll all work re really well. So I am not necessarily your usual keynote because my life grew up, in, my life in government grew up in technology. Uh, I am a lifetime public administrator. I started in 1975 in the town of Morristown, which remarkably coincidentally is only a stone's throw a place called Denville where Carol Spencer got her start in government in 19, what, 1996, if I recall correctly, right, Carol? 1990 on the council, okay. So, uh, so Carol and I have known each other for many years and have been through the ups and downs of local government tech and web life for, for a very long time. Also in New Jersey, I got to bootstrap the New Jersey chapter of Jemis. Uh, Jemis was alive and well in New Jersey. In the 60s, it kind of died out when mainframes went away. And I was really uh, surprised and happy that I was in a position to start a New Jersey chapter. That led me to working with the New, with the New Jersey chapter of NAGLA and folks like Katja, who uh, is the reason I'm here today. She in, in, encouraged me to come out and, and do this event, so I thank you for that. So I've worked with technology groups for a while, and you guys are a technology group. Uh, the Jersey chapters participated with uh, New Jersey Jemis in, in our annual technology education conference and has been a good partner with us over the years. And having, I was here for a little bit the other day and looking at your, at your program, I just want to congratulate the association and its officers, Leslie and all, all, all you guys, for what I think was a ter sounded like a terrific program, that you guys are very deep into the challenges of figuring out how to get public communications out to people. Uh, we are in a very interesting and exciting time and I think what you've, what you've been doing is really admirable, and I am just really impressed by the whole thing. Um, let me give you a little bit more pieces of background, which some of you may find really interesting, particularly those of you who are older. Um, those of you who are younger will have no idea what I'm talking about. When I say I started as the, uh, my role in technology started as an audiovisual aids guy in high school uh, with 16 millimeter films, film strips, uh, and the like. Um, my high school, remarkably, in Morristown, New Jersey, uh, got a small used IBM mainframe in 1969. And that, in 1970, I was the uh, junior, vars junior varsity baseball manager. And we had a senior in high school who learned Fortran and figured out how he could write a baseball statistics program. So the, and, and doing statistics in those days was a manual type of thing. You had tables and it was highly annoying because after each game you had to do the stats for every player on the team. So he wrote this program, and I got sucked in because I could type a little bit, and I wound up being the key punch guy 
that sat at the 80, you know, the 80, at the 80 column card punch machine and had to put in the statistics for each player after each game. But the magic was then we put in an operating system deck, we put in a program deck, we put in a data deck, and I got this one wonderful one page print out of everybody's statistics. And at that point I said, okay, this is really good. I wanna do this more. So I got into computers and I basically grew up in the mini and, and PC era. Uh, my first, the first computer, microcomputer I ever played with was an Apple IIc, a 2E rather, and Osborne and K-Pros and all of those things. And every organization I worked with is a in a municipal administration, I brought to the next level of PCs. Right? And then when I worked for state government and, we, and this thing called the internet started and we had these websites uh, using Mosaic and Netscape Navigator, this is how far this goes back, I got my organization online as one of the first New Jersey state agencies to have a text-based web presence. And we just grew from there. So um, I've done a lot of other work in my day um, as a business administrator and a state agency folks, guy charged with oversight of local governments in the state. But it's always been a tech drive to what I do. So um, one of the things I have learned over the years is that it's really hard to predict what's next in technology and what's gonna happen. Predicting three to five years is really hard to do. And as I was starting to prepare for this presentation, which I said, well, let me talk about what it'll be like to be a webmaster in 2025. And I realized there is no freaking way that we can predict what that's going to be. I don't think any of you who've been in the business more than five years, all right, could predict where you are today. All right, it's not just an evolution, it's a very fast evolution. And things have been moving very, very quickly. So um, I hope you won't be disappointed. I'm not gonna be able to tell you how you're gonna wake up in, in 2025 and that you'll be able to do all your work from home uh, with high speed internet. I'm not gonna be able to tell you that because I'm not gonna predict that puppy. However, I am gonna talk about a number of the challenges we are facing in government technology, sort of societally as well, right? But unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to give you a lot of answers. Uh, so before I jump into the, the, the rest of this thing, I just want a couple questions for you guys, because this is gonna be a little interactive, by the way, because at various spots in this, I've got some questions and answers, some questions, that I'm gonna ask you guys, and I'm gonna ask for a couple people at each spot to just stand up and give us a sense of what, of how you perceive that or what your answer to the question's going to be. So first question, how many of you come from gov local governments uh, that are more than, that are less than 50,000 in population? Okay, uh, between 50 and 100? Uh, there's a sweet spot. Um, two, uh, 100 to 250? Oh, bigger sweet spot, and over 250? Okay, so we're dealing with a large end here. That's good to know. Uh, focus, and I know this is of some discussion with NAGWA because I'm, I'm friends with Alan Shark, and I know he was here er earlier in the week to roll out the, the new certification program. How many of you's primary, your focus is primarily technical in nature? And how many of you blend communications in with that? Com communication responsibility, whoa. Okay, it just bodes well for the, for the certification program. Very good. Uh, how many of you use your own in-house developed platforms where you mix and match vendor products together? Wow, okay, and how many of you use, basically work off and modify a commercial platform? That's about evenly mixed. Oh, this is, a fast, this is fascinating. This is really interesting. Okay, so uh, let me find my magic. remote control, which is buried in this space pocket of mine. Oh, why is that doing that? Hold on. Didn't realize I was showing you presenter mode. There we go. So, challenging technology. Is technology challenging us or is it just really hard to do? It's hard to manage and it makes us think. Hopefully I will not fall off this podium. It's going to get us whatever is next. And one of the challenges we have is figuring out what is next for us 
in government, given some of the changes we're seeing in, in government at the national level and some uncertainty of how that's going to roll through or if it does at all to, to, to local government. But we're going to do an interactive discussion of challenges webmasters and public communicators and their organizations face today and tomorrow. And I'm kind of going to talk, if I can, from the perspective of a webmaster and your management. Uh, and, and hopefully some of the things we'll talk about are the things that are bugging you and how we can talk about ha handling those things. But first, I want to give you um, this. Hold on. Wrong slide here. Uh, OK, we have a technical issue here that this is not supposed to be happening. Stop doing this. PowerPoint on a Mac, I'll tell you, it's um, not always, yeah, really, tell me about it. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to turn this off then. See if this solves it. <laughs> the hell? Because I'm not seeing that on my screen. Well, this is embarrassing. Oh, somebody good at PowerPoint? I'll take it. Because right now it is wait, the mark are we cranky? Let me see if I can help you. One, two, three. Yeah, hi Susan. Yeah, go ahead, hit it. Wait, this is what you're displaying? Yes. This is what I want to display, but I've got a problem because it's not what's coming up. Now it seems stuck. Yeah, go ahead. All right, we're going to reboot that and see if we can make that work. In the meantime, while that's coming up, let me go into my first little screed here. Technology-driven societal change is happening before our eyes. I mean, it's really there. Society is going through complex changes, and technology is what's driving or amplifying that. It has brought us initial seismic and aftershocks in the economy, disintermediation in markets, particularly in retail and the media, alterations in income distribution, environmental complications, and the blurring of political lines. And all of that's compounded by social changes of constant distribution of information through multiple channels of often unmediated information, which is something we euphemistically call the news. Further, as a culture, we become particularly skilled at taking any real or imagined circumstances or set of facts or minutia and spinning it in a way that reflects the message or viewpoint of the originator, and so it fits in with preconceived beliefs. That's a really interesting problem, and I've been observing this now, and I think hopefully you guys have too, and we don't seem to have a way out of that, which, which is its, its own set, set of problems. Taken together, however, these circumstances have pretty much brought complications and challenges to pretty much every sector of civic life. So in that, boy, we did bad there, huh? We killed Wow, that's not good. Yeah, that's, there it is. It's, it's there. Yeah, right there. Oh, just hit no. Okay. So let's try it again. Just do play from current slide. No, that wasn't good. Okay. All right. To continue. To narrow this down to room D, E, and F in the Hyatt Aventine in La Jolla, in the government tech world, it's pretty obvious that you are all, you are all receiving and subject to countless tech news blogs, newsletters, and promotional communications that reflect the breadth of technology development. As each actor tries to break through the clutter to get your attention on calls to action to convince you to act on their message. And, and that's one of the interesting challenges we have is that so much of what we are, we are doing today, thank you, <laughs> hear it for the techie. All right, uh, basically these calls to actions to convince you to act on their message. And we also see that all those vendors and organizations that are promoting a particular viewpoint from technology are getting into the media. And that's driving a lot of the discussion that your bosses see, that your managers see. 
or frankly, when it comes to cybersecurity that your, your bosses don't see and your managers don't understand. But we're going to talk a little bit about that and what that has wrought on your work life. But first, I want to give you Pfeiffer's three rules of government administration, um, things that I kind of developed in teaching Master of Public Administration programs. So the first rule is things change and poop emoji happens. <laughs> All right? We have no way to predict what's going to happen because anything can happen in the political world, in the government world, and all of a sudden you're upended overnight. Right? And, and we, we, don't, we have never been able to control that and we just have to realize we're not always going to have certainty. Second one complements that. You don't know what you don't know. Right? Um, and that's like a touch thing for me when people are telling me we should absolutely do this because here's what's going to happen. I say, well, wait a minute. What about the unintended consequences of what we're talking about doing? Have you thought about what that potential might be? What are the risks involved in things? Right? So we, we don't think about that stuff v very well. Um, we, we try. We try to get solutions done, not knowing what we don't know. But we don't make it easy because in a lot of tech world, we get missed deadlines, inadequate training, missed uses, confusing policies, and user confusion. Uh, I have seen any number of statistics that talk about when we try to implement new technology programs in government, 50% of them can fail, or they'll miss their deadline, or they'll go way over budget. Right? We've seen that at the federal level, we've seen it at the state level, and I'm sure you've seen it at the local level as well. And the third one, which I've recently added, just because we can doesn't mean we should. That's a really challenging issue. Because every new tech innovation that some entrepreneur is able to come up with in Silicon Valley can find some venture capitalist to fund because they think there's this incredible idea. We don't really think about what the implications of that are or what the unintended consequences would be. There's just an assumption that it's good for us, so we should go ahead and do it. Right? Just because the market will say, okay, yeah, let's do this. We don't think about how it upends planning processes, social equity issues. We don't think about any of that. We just go, people just go full steam and the market decides that. That's not a horrible thing necessarily. And there's a lot of good that's come from that. But at the same time, we are now starting to see the unintended consequences of that when it comes to cybersecurity, privacy, we go into how government works, we're seeing mobility issues, we're seeing things with parking and traffic due to autonom autonomous vehicles and our friends up at Uber who have thinks that just because they want to do it, everybody needs to bend their laws and process to that. Right? That's, an in that's an interesting little challenge. So first thing I want to talk about then, a first challenge is artificial intelligence. Now the slide is basically a list of companies who are in various parts of the AI business and machine learning business, all right? Um, one of the things on this thing says that there are, contact these people to access the full landscape report and database with all 1,464 companies. What the hell? <laughs> you know? Uh, Richard Florida is a guy who uh, works for Atlantic Magazine. He's up at the University of, Tor of Toronto as well. And he is one of the great researchers of data of what's happening in urban areas and suburban areas in, 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 in the country. And uh, Atlantic Magazine runs a thing called City Lab, which is a great newsletter and website. And if you're not on it and you want to keep up on what's going on in, in cities, I would find City Lab and su subscribe to their daily. But he wrote that AI brings a contradictory future to our cities. On one hand, tech optimists see technology like autonomous vehicles, mobile health care, and robot teachers freeing us from mundane chores like commuting and waiting in doctor's offices and making our cities better, more inclusive and sustainable places. On the other hand, te techno-pessimists see a dystopian future where AI and robots take away jobs and we all live in a state of perpetual surveillance. That pretty much summarizes where we are with AI today. A lot of possibilities, a lot of potential, we have no control over it whatsoever, and something's going to happen. And how we make decisions and how those decisions, gets made, th those decisions get made are going to be a real interesting challenge. There was just a piece that I read in the Washington Post last week, a guy named Franklin Foer, F-O-E-R, if you want to follow up. He wrote a piece on how Silicon Valley is erasing your individuality. That's sort of dystopian sounding, but it's kind of up the middle because he does a good job of painting 
here's what's happening, and here's what can happen with folks. And I, I commend that one to you. It's a very well-written piece that tries to balance the challenge. His name is Franklin Foer, F-O-E-R. So um, you can find, find him online. He's got a Twitter feed. I think it's just his name all, all condensed together. So that's one of our little challenges. Our next challenge, and let me just do this, basically is transparency and records management and records retention challenges. And this is something I suspect that a lot of you are wrestling with right now. The challenges of text messages and how people in government communicate with each other. Um, I spent a good part, I spent part of my career in New Jersey when we rolled out our Open, Gov our open Public Records Act, or OPRA, it's our version of, of, a, of, of a FOIA law. I got to be the executive, the startup executive director of that for a year and a half. And one of the things that we talked about, this was back in 2002, that, you know, new transparency is good, which I believe it is, um, and, and, sunshine, and sunlight is the best disinfectant, and that goes back to a Supreme Court justice from, from the uh, 19, from 1940s. And it's generally a good concept. However, those ideas came out before we had the way technology has invaded and, invest, and invested in how we manage our records. Right? Remember, just because we can, should we? You know, text messages. It's conversation. All right? Is an informal conversation between two people something that should be documented just because it can be? If yes, shouldn't they all be documented in some way, or is it technology the thing that lets us do it? Again, just because we can, should we? All right? why, sh why should the availability of tech be the differentiator? Is that, okay, we don't disclose phone calls, but we can disclose text, text messages because we can. Telephone calls, we, unless we're going to start surveilling everybody and recording every phone call, that's never going to happen. We don't, we, don't do sun, do, we don't do transparency on conversations, physical, in-person conversations people have. But a text message is effectively the same thing. It just happens to be awkwardly documented. Right? And we've got a couple companies right, who have invested in a business in being able to record that for us and keep that for a fee. But what are we doing with that? Arguably, and I, and I don't mean to, to make fun of this, but in the real world, too much sunlight can create skin cancer. Too much disinfectant right, creates problems. Right? We, don't we don't really talk about that discussion when it comes to government records. Um, how does government action and decision making take place in an environment when there are multiple actors who want to be engaged in decision making and are also willing to litigate if they, get, they don't get their own way? Because we have so many more people who are involved in government and want to be involved in decision making, we are now finding it very difficult to make decisions. Our elected officials get caught between, between political polls all right, and our political process which makes decision making even harder. And we don't do that very well, right? Because we've assumed just because we can do something, we should. And we're having challenges right now in how that works. Oh, yeah, there's no slide for this, that's okay. There isn't, I, I've got cues in here that'll open that up, but yeah, we're fine, thank you though. So let me ask you a question. This is our first question for, 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 for you guys, all right? How many of you are archiving social media and text messages? All right, and I'm curious, how is that working out? So let's see if we can, if we can walk around and get some people to comment on that. How's, how, what difficulties are you seeing with that, or what challenges are there in, in your archiving? Anybody wanna comment on that publicly? <laughs> it's being recorded. <laughs> we have somebody in the back? Yes, who are, first of all, who are you and where you're from, if you can, if you like telling me. You can be anonymous if you want. Sure, I'm Susan Wallach, I'm from the city of Longmont in Colorado. Um, shortly after we had a flood in September of 2013, I looked at trying to um, obtain programs that would help me document everything. And uh, one of the programs that I uh, acquired was Archive Social. Um, and I immediately hooked up all of our social media accounts that we had at the time, and that number's grown and I just let it run. I've not yet ever needed to pull anything out of it. Um, however, our city attorneys were very grateful that I have something 
running automatically that's capturing everything. And, and the everything is just everything that goes on from a social media standpoint. Comments, the whole, and you're open for comments. Right. Whole thing. And it's also tracking anything that has been deleted. So if someone posts something and then they delete it on their end, we can see it in our archive. If we delete it because it doesn't follow our comment policy, then you know we take action to uh, delete that post and document it. And so knowing that it's also captured in archive social is nice because I can just do a search and pull up all of the deleted comments. It's like a, you know, a toggle box. Yeah. Okay. And that hasn't caused you any difficulties or anything like that yet? No. Okay, good. Anybody else want to comment on that? Challenges of it? See, I come from New Jersey where one of the interesting things we had was a, 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 some aides in the governor's office had text messaging, did some text messages, and one of those text messages was, it's time for Fort Lee to have some traffic problems. And you can see where that went and the smoking gun that that created. So it clearly was enlightening there. Yeah. Um, Colleen Killian with the City of Champaign and Champaign, Illinois. We back all of our social media up also to Archive Social. We had another um, software that we used that was not reliable, fell down all the time. Um, and it's great. We've never had to go into it or do anything with it. However, we have a lot of our departments making their own social media accounts that are not signing up with it and oh. then they come to us and they're like you're backing this up and it's like uh, no you need to let us know so we have the tools but we we're we're fixing our social media policies so that any department that creates social media which is great w gets backed up on it as well because we've had some um, lawsuits in the past we had a mayor who liked to tweet a lot and sometimes was not appropriate so we unfortunately, prior to that, we got a lot of FOIA requests. Nice. So, yeah, it's, quite it's a, a long story. Now, yeah. Ask me about it another time. But, right. uh, but yeah, so I mean, we, we do it again. If people delete stuff, we have it backing that up as well as more of a protection. Once, once you get bit, right. you kind of make sure you don't, ha that doesn't happen again. Yeah. How about text messaging? Anybody doing text messaging? Oh, that's interesting. Yes. I'm not in the IT department, I'm in communications, but they were doing a pilot for city-owned phones oh, only. Okay. So if you, you have your own phone and you're texting to another city employee, it wouldn't necessarily be captured. I really don't know what the status of that project is. In my world, in, in the Jersey world, even if you use your, whatever, if you do anything on any device that's government related, it's disclosable on, under Oprah. So we have, we have this problem of uh, people using their own their own phones and their own text messages on their own accounts. And plus, we still have some people using their own email, which is a whole, which is a whole other problem. So that's uh, another issue. Okay, um, Internet of Things and big data implications. All right, this is another interesting challenge that we have. Um, talk about analytics, the challenge of collecting, managing, and visualizing app data. The applications that are needed to do that is something that is really starting to grow in government agencies. Um, we, need, we have staffing issues, transparency issues, and policies regarding security that when we take all the data that governments collect and we start putting them out on the web, anybody can have access at, the, at, at that data. The, um, the science and skill involved in anonymizing data has kind of gotten broken by people who've gotten very good at re-anonymizing data. There's data brokers, there's, there's credit collection, <laughs> credit collection organizations that theoretically collect data about your credit worthiness, and we understand now that they have been subject to some hacking challenges over the last couple years, the last, last few months. So we have this data out there, and we can anonymize it, but what we're finding is that when, that when we put data out there, there's other data sources that people have access to. That if you, you know, you know where, if you, you say, well, in this zip code, we had X number of accidents caused by people in, in particular age brackets. All right, well, what happened to those? And maybe now we can merge that with other data and we can find out exactly who those people might be. And that's raising some privacy concerns. Um, another great example, San Diego, as a headline, uh, is, is to tackle the largest multi-sensor pod development in the U.S. to date. This was from early this year. Uh, by the end of 2017, San Diego expects to have 3,200 multi-sensor pods attached to light poles all around the city to listen for gunshots, count cars, and monitor air temperature. 
right? So there's a lot of data the city's going to be collecting, and a lot of that's going to be public data. It's going to have to be publicly available, right? Are we using commercial websites to post that information, making it available to anybody? Is it going to be posted locally? If it's going to be hosted on your sites, is that a new, a new application that, that has to be developed? We know that big data could soon allow us to shape public policy, financial products, health care, and education to suit our personal needs. But are we willing to sacrifice our privacy for products and services that are more relevant to us? Every day when you use a free email account, right, Gmail, Yahoo, well, Yahoo, uh, Microsoft Live, whatever, right, you're, you're, give it, you're getting it for free, but you're giving it up with data and your searches, right? People are now becoming more concerned about that. And uh, we don't know where that's going to go. Um, so we need to fi figure out how we manage that stuff. So next question, how many of you have a formal Internet of Things p p policy and or a big, a big data program? And how is that starting out? Any, any issues involved? There? Anybody have big data at this point? You want to think about it? No, no, really? Oh, that's interesting. You got one, Wes? So we are just starting to kind of like gather a committee of people, um, IT's, you know, trying to get with like, you know, police and fire and like our water treatment plants and just starting the conversation, but that's as far as we've got. Okay, well that's, that's where that has to start. And IT and web has to be at the table because you've got all this data and if it's going to be available publicly, what's the process for doing that? I know I've had some discussions with people at, at Rutgers that, you know, if government's putting all this information out there and they theoretically, they're anonymizing it, so how do we know the users won't try to re-identify it? And in the academic world, there's all kinds of constraints that we can put on data that talk about disclosure and you can only get, use data for the specific purposes that it was intended for. And I think we're going to probably see some discussions along those lines saying, okay, if you're going to take this, this set of data, before you get it, you're going to sign some type of commitment letter saying here's the uses the data is going to, to be put through. And if you violate those, th those rules, you may be subject to prosecution for misuse of data. There's an interesting discussion that I think we're going to be having about that go going forward. Because otherwise, there won't be any point of trying to anonymize data because there's ways that people are finding to re-anonymize it. To, to, excuse me, re-identify. Carol? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, there's you all types of issues. And and you can you, and how many of you deal with public schools at all? Any of you? Because public schools, I'm I'm going to some meetings where we're talking about IT people and ed tech people. Schools have a whole other interesting set of, of, of issues with that because depending on the data that goes out there and what level, what, how granular it becomes, there's other sources it could be merged to to try, to try to identify students. And that has its own set of issues. So there, there's a whole uncertainty coming through with that. So our, our next issue is social media. And the Pew Foundation does a lot of really good, good research to help society understand the challenges of social media how it's being used and what its applications are. And um, the issue of trolls keeps coming up. So here's a couple points that Pew had on this, as far as the, the future of it. They say, one, things will stay bad because to troll is human, and anonymity abets bad behavior. Inequities are motivating inflammatory dialogue, and the growing scale and complexity of internet discourse makes this difficult to defeat. That's one option for the future. Second one. Things will stay bad because tangible and intangible economic and political, incent political incentives support trolling. The notion that participation equals power and profits. Right? You have a site that attracts attention. There may be trolls on it, but it's attracting attention. Attracts more eyeballs, more advertising money for the people that, that run the site. Third option. Things will get better because technical and human will, humans will arise as the online world splinters 
into segmented control zones with the help of artificial intelligence. That's an interesting application of tech. We know Facebook, all right, is starting to figure out how to use AI to control trolls. New York Times has been doing it. Their comment sections are now effectively moderated through AI programs that will knock out the people who are just obliquely tr trying to troll, or, excuse me, directly trying to troll. So there's real interesting implications for that, but one of the challenges with AI is that AI only knows what it's learned. And if it doesn't learn from a broad, broad set of circumstances and a broad set of input going into it, it's not gonna know all that much. It's not gonna know how to handle new and different circumstances. And that's one of the challenges with the world of, of, of AI. Fourth point, oversight and moderation will come with a cost. Some solutions could change the nature of the internet because surveillance will rise, the state may regulate debate, and these changes will polarize people and limit access to information on, and, and free speech. Well, three of the four of these things are not terribly positive. So we want to hope maybe that there might be a fifth way that we're able to find but the reality is people who want to be trolls don't have any disincentive to not do trolling, right? And we see it more and more and it's more and more challenging and somehow, you know, this is one of those unintended, unintended consequences is what we didn't know what we didn't know, right? And trolling is, is that and it's a remarkably insidious and unfortunate commentary on, on societies and uh, I don't know. How we're going to do how that one to fix the fix for that? I have no idea. Um, another point here: uh, social media content credibility comes from sharers, not creators. And this was a study that Archive Social did a couple months ago. Um, they they realized that credibility doesn't come from the people who created it; it comes from how information is shared. That people trust information that they hear from other people. They said in their report, the credibility of online content is strongly linked to the people or organizations sharing it. For government and social media files, the news means that building trust and rapport with followers should be the top of their mind. So if once news gets out there, people rely on it being shared, not, and not from necessarily from the direct source, to build trust. One of the challenges we're having in government today is the fact that folks don't necessarily have a lot of trust in us. So if, from the public communication standpoint, how do you promote trust? What tactics and strategies can you use to find influencers, right, and communicate with them so they can also share information which builds trust in what you guys are doing? That's sort of the bottom line in a sense, because if public communication, just putting stuff out there Right, and letting it sit there and hopefully people will find it, that's a pretty dicey way of approaching and trying to get your word out there. It's not like it was when I started in government, how did we publicly communicate? We sent out press releases to the newspaper, which everybody in town got. I think the town I, I, the town I worked, I started my career in Morris, Morristown, was the county seat. The daily newspaper had a penetration of 110% of the families in town. All right? They basically oversold because there were businesses and some households got, got two newspapers and things like that. But that's how the news got out there. We talked to reporters. We did press releases. Right? That's where news came from. Today, it's a lot harder. So many channels of information because when you're pushing something out, yeah, you still may be doing a press release to the local newspaper. You may wind up doing a video for a, a, video for a, for a TV station. You're gonna push, put stuff on your website. You're gonna push something out on Twitter. You're gonna push it out on, on Facebook. There may be some other blogs around and some bloggers who you're gonna reach out to. You're probably gonna use some kind of signage as well. So the public communication is a lot more challenging, different channels, but you still, at the end of the day, need to build trust with it. So that's sort of that, that particular problem there. Um, so we also have news reliability, editing, and content decisions in, and distribution channels. Where does the government transparency meter get set? How much do you share? What goes out to people? What do you promote and don't? And how does that meet ex public expectations? And how do you try to manage the, the, the expectations? 
questions like how accessible do we come at what cost of time, attention, and money? Right? 20 years ago, we weren't doing any of this stuff. Today, we're thinking about sharing. We need people involved in making those decisions. We need technology that's going to put that information online and make it accessible to people. How many different channels do you use in your community? How many different outlets do you have to serve to get public information out there to people? All right? um, it is very hard. And I don't, and again, and I think everybody has to think about this on their own. Let me shut that down for a second here. Moving to mobile, that's the next area, all right? Uh, recent headlines, bill would mandate mobile-friendly federal websites. Almost half of traffic to federal government sites comes from smartphones and tablets. How many of you have sites that are not mobile-friendly today? Show of hands, that are not mobile-friendly. So I'm assuming that 95% of you have mobile-friendly websites now. That's really terrific. That's, I, I'm, I'm surprised to see that, so that's really great, guys. I, I'm going to use that now when I talk to people back in Jersey, particularly, where I don't think we've got that level of penetration. Katja, I don't know, are you guys seeing a lot of that now in your world? Yeah? That mobile's incredibly important now, and it's going to be for transactions. Now, you're all trans government transactions. More and more transactions are going to be online, and it's going to have to be through mobile, all right? And your governing bodies also need to understand that that's where their, con that's where their constituents are, that you have to serve them there. A couple points I want to make on public safety. Police and fire body cams, right? They are a whole new world that we are just start seeing the tip of the iceberg on, on what the impact is going to be. In a lot of places, it's had incredible success, and, and it's a true value to law enforcement and, and to the public. But we're also finding problems that the systems don't work at certain times, the perspective isn't terribly good. When there is a critical incident, that's where things can go upside down. That's where body cameras may not be able to record everything that's happening. And if a law enforcement officer is involved in, in, in a scuffle, right, that camera may get dislodged and not show what, it, what people want it to. And we have a public now that's expecting to see body cameras on all law enforcement officers, though that were all, when, there, when those outlier events take place, where there is a shooting and an unfortunate death. People expect to see video evidence of it now. There's a public expectation that has grown for that. And your organizations are going to be very challenged on how you deal with that. In addition to the challenge of doing the recording, we now have the issue of, pub, of public access to those recordings and who can see them. All right? What are we doing as far as making those things available to people who put in FOIA, or in New Jersey's case, Oprah requests, for videos of individual officers? We're starting to see places where, pe where people are suspect of an officer who may not be behaving properly is wanting videos of, of the officer's interactions with people. That creates a public disclosure nightmare for law enforcement officers who now have to go through those videos and make sure that they are redacted as far as innocent bystanders who, who, who are involved. We also have questions being raised that just because I may be involved in a police incident right, that nobody else saw, why should somebody else be able to view that video just because they can, because they can make a, a public records request to see that? Why should that happen? Right? Or is it, well, you talked to a police officer, you had a problem, well, it's now public information. We've, had a, we've done a really bad job of asking those questions because the assumption is, well, it's a public record, we should disclose it. But our public records laws were not designed to deal with that particular technology. Nobody saw that coming. I can tell you, in, the, in 2001, when New Jersey's law was drafted, this was not on any, in anybody's imagination that we would have videotape, videos easily accessible of every possible police incident that happens. Right? Our laws do not reflect that, and we have a real challenge in trying to make that stuff work. Um, drones are becoming incredibly effective tools for law enforcement and public safety purposes. All right? It can keep officers out of harm's way. It can help firefighters assess the potential problems that a response that a fire is going to need. From emergency management standpoint, it can assess damage far better 
and faster and more efficiently than putting people out there. So from a government use standpoint, this is one of the best tools we've come up with in decades. It's a remarkably useful tool to have. On the other hand, we see public using it for commercial purposes where it's an incredibly valuable tool for real estate people, right? But we also see potential of harassment where people who don't like somebody else will put a drone up to track them to try to follow them around, look at, look at office buildings, peer into office buildings and structures, right? We're trying to figure out how to regulate it. The FAA has done some good work with that. But look, we now have a fight going on as to, well, how much can local governments regulate what is sort of preempted by the FAA? So a lot of municipalities are now starting to struggle with local ordinances that talk about private use of drones. Right? And government, well, we're kind of caught up in the middle of that because we don't have any special right under the FAA regs. We still have to follow all of that too. So there's a real interesting challenge coming up on that, which hopefully over the next year or two will be resolved. But you know, drones are great from a government standpoint, but they can be horribly abused by, by individuals. This is again, that's the trolling thing. 911, emergency calling, uh, is one of the greatest single expenses to public safety these days because everybody's got to upgrade to be able to handle text messages and video feeds that, that are sent in by the public. Right? Making the job of a 911 dispatcher really, really challenging now. As hard as that job has been in the past, and believe me, I've been in those, I've been in those sites and watched it, those can be very challenging jobs. Sometimes they're boring as hell, in the middle of the night in a suburb, in a mi the middle of the week in a nighttime shift in a suburban community, there's not a lot going on. But when something happens, or there's an individual incident, we have all kinds of new, new challenges there. And we're not really good at doing that, and a lot of governing bodies don't want to pay the expense of having to do it. So we got to be thinking about that as well. That's, that's its own challenge. So that's some of the technology issues. I want to talk about um, the management side of this. And here's some headlines that we've seen. City Hall computer upgrades plagued by years of delays, millions in extra costs. Employers are creepily analyzing your emails and Slack chats to see if you are happy. And that's primarily a, pro a private sector issue, but it's going to be in the public sector as well, because we're using all these tools. It all it's all become available to employers. So what's going on with that? Fire in Ohio schools, servers susceptible to hackers in a wrecked building. The servers were, in this particular case, the servers were sitting in the basement in an, in an unprotected area. Finally, Texas City employees hacked. W-2 forms of 800 employees fall into the hands of scammers. That's called, called business email compromise, where somebody sent, spoofed a letter, an email from the mayor to the, to the HR department, and it said, I need a file of the, of all, of the W-2s of all our employees. The clerk in the personnel office who got the email it said it, it appeared to be from the mayor, I'm not gonna question the mayor. Attaches the file and boom, it goes out to, to, to a scammer because they didn't catch that the reply was not the mayor's office. So we have a whole new world of, bus of business email compromise for the transmission of information and money as well. We had a case in New Jersey where somebody did a, a, a spearfish on a, on a bookkeeper in a town that looked like it came from the part-time CFO Email said, hey, I'm going to be tied up in negotiations all day, but I need you to, I need you to wire transfer $40,000 to such and such. The email looked like it came from the CFO because they spoof, the scammer spoofed the email. Bookkeeper does it, sends the transfer out, hits reply, says, okay, I did this. And went back to the CFO. CFO got the email and said, you did what? Right? But this points to the fact that we now have to start thinking differently from a management standpoint about how we deal with new technology. Right? We're paying, we make payments now electronically through the ACH system. What account numbers are those going to? How do you know if you get an email from a vendor saying, hey, I changed my account and my banking information. Please send the information to this bank account now. We now need a control that says we're going to verify that clearly and specifically through humans the way you have to deal with that stuff. So I've done a lot of work 
in the last couple of years on technology risk. Right? Not just cybersecurity, which is the elephant in the room that everybody's always talking about, but the risk, of ha of the risk that government face because of, tech of, of, its, of its technology. Kind of came up with a chart that highlights six things. And clearly, cybersecurity is the big one. But managing technology also has financial risks, operational, legal, reputational, and societal. And I got a whole separate presentation I do on this stuff, but I'm, which I'm not going to go into much more, much more detail on. But these are risks that governments need to start thinking about when it comes to managing their tech. Because pretty much everything that goes on in a government today is touched by technology in one way or another. It, you're not escaping it anymore. Right? And most governing bodies and senior managers, my friends at ICMA, for example, particularly in smaller towns, don't get the fact that attention must be paid to these things. Right? Technology is just like, it's, it's, it's just creeping along. OK, we need to do this this year. OK, next year we'll try to do this. Wait a minute, you say you need to replace the servers. You sure you can't get another year out of them? All right, it's because we can't really afford to do it this year. Right? Well, the IT guy says, well, yeah, but I can't take, I'm not going to promise you that it's not going to crash on us during the year. And when it crashes during the year, there's all kinds of people running around and po pointing fingers as to how that happened and what services did you lose along the way. Right? Governing bodies still don't understand that there's reputational risks to them in understanding that you know, if their technology blows up in their face, they, will fa they can face political reputation, excuse me, political responses from voters saying, wait a minute, you're supposed to be running this place. You can't get the technology right? Because a lot of governing members don't, un governing bodies don't understand technology. And that's a problem for them. So we've got these risks. And, and again, there's a whole world that I think organizations need to start looking at and understanding their risks so they can make informed decisions about their technology and how they manage it. So um, in order, so I came up with a little methodology that provides a way to think about this stuff. And it's the idea of becoming technologically proficient. And there's three elements to that. Technology management, which is effectively governance, how you make your decisions on tech, having a planning process of some kind, regardless of the size of your organization, tying that planning to your budgeting process, and it's all held together by risk assessments. Right? Understanding what are my risks, what do I have to do, if I'm developing a new service, what are my risks in that and how do I mitigate them? That ties to your planning process, which gets decision making involved, and then people have to agree to fund it. And that's that challenge. Second element is cyber hygiene. It's making sure your employees aren't going to see an email and go boop on it when it's a spear fish. Right? Invite ransomware in, create a hole in the network for some malware to, to get in, where a bad guy gets in and starts roaming around your network looking for the files that says, Employee Social Security dot XLS. All right, that's the worst case scenario. So we need to train employees regularly because the cyber threats keep changing. So all employees that touch computers have to understand these are the risks, here's how to watch for social engineering, here's to respond, here's what to do when you think you see something bad happening. Finally, technical competency, which is basically where cybersecurity lies. Right? That you are running your technology in the best possible way you can. That you are using up-to-date practices. That you are patching software as new releases come out. When a vendor says, hey, we've got a new hole all right, in, 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 well, I'll say Flash because it's easy to pick on. All right? All right? Or Apache Struts. All right? People in Equifax seem to have missed that email. Right? But you know, how are you responding? How do you manage your tech? Are your people sufficiently trained? Right? Is your equipment sufficient? Are your servers running correctly? Do you have protection systems on your network? Are they running right? Are you keeping things up to date? You know, the, you've got the whole top 20 things you're supposed to do to, ma to manage your cyber risks. Right? So we got those three things. Then we talk about customer focus. And I'm sure you hear this from management as well. Who are, who are the customers that we're focusing on? I would suggest there's not just one class of customer. All right? You have customers, people who are, come to you to do transactions with you. All right? 
voluntarily come to you, or they might have to, but you also have people who are called constituents. These are the people who you need, who you need to respond to to make their lives better. These are the people who vote. These are the people who are engaged in politics. All right? These are the people you serve on a day-to-day -day basis, and you serve them. All right? What you provide a constituent is non-optional. Then you have consumers, right? people who come to buy something from you. These are the people who are buying a service from you that may be optional. They may be buying parking services from you. They may need business permits. All right, where you're serving them in a consumer in a consumer type environment, where you want to make that service as effective and efficient and user friendly as possible. And finally, there's a third one. And it used to historically they call these the three C's, right? But there's another group who you are also serving, and that's staff, right? Because we've got this job in technology to make it easy for the people who are doing the work in the government to get their job done. That's part of the goal here. How easy are you making it for them to use your technology? Right? In your particular world, how are we making web updates? How, what, what do agency, what's the job of the agency in getting their information up? Right? Or using a CMS so they're able to post that stuff, them, stuff themselves. For you guys in public communications, how much confidence do you have in that they're writing it literally? Right, that they're using they're using they're not using bad grammar and somebody proofread it and, and, and edited it. What's your process for that? You don't want to tie them up with a lot of red tape. So the challenge is to deal with those folks as well as you can, but they require a different touch, a different sense of how you are delivering your service to them. And let me do another uh, question for you guys, see if anybody wants to comment on this. The things I've talked about tech management. How, can you, any of you want to tell me a little bit about how your organization uh, proficiently manages its tech? Do you have a formal tech management process, or is it very informal? Do you have a, for, a strong chain of command, where you've got a CIO who reports to the city manager, or the city administrator, or the mayor? Or is the technology buried in the organization? Anybody, some thoughts on, any, any thoughts on that? At all? Want to talk about it? We got somebody? Yeah. It's on. It's on. <laughs> Our uh, information technology director is also certified, um, is also security cer certified, as is our network. What did they call him now? Network services manager. Okay. So they're both security certified, and we all have to. Um, have annual, not just in IT, but the entire staff has to be um, trained annually. It's not really brain taxing training, right. but it's, you know, this is how to identify a phishing scam. And, Good. Um, and so we, we do have some real, f have some formal policies in there. That's good. I, th I think one of the things we talk about is that organizations need is you need to have policies on email and you need to train folks because you know what are the consequences for clicking on an email attachment that's a zip file from somebody you didn't you don't know who it was and you weren't expecting right or if you're in the finance office and you get a thing saying hey here's the bill from Costco or something was charged to your account please open the attachment and the attachment is going to be a bug all right so technology management becomes, becomes very important. So, um, and, and unfortunately, I think it's, it's something that a lot of organizations are not spending a lot of time on. And I think arguably they need to because if they don't, things are going to start to collapse. Doing this stuff on a catch-as-catch-can basis, I think, is going to be very defeating over time. Another problem we have is coping with change. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing. This slide starts on the left in 1993, and it's internet users in the world. And it starts at zero, and in 2016, it's topping off at over three billion people. But look at that curve of adoption, particularly starting around uh, 2007 here, and it's more than doubled in that decade. Right, that's worldwide. The speed of that uptake is remarkable. 
Uh, this is from 2014, internet users worldwide looking at China, US, and India. So US in the middle, 13, you know, population of 313 million, 245 people on the internet. But now look at China in, in India, the room they have to grow and the take up that, that those places are gonna have. This is technology adoption rates. So start at the bottom, we see the years taken until adopted by 25% of the US population. Electricity went from zero to 25% in about 45 years. Telephone 35, radio shorter. Notice it's got shorter and shorter and shorter. The smartphones was about four years that you had 25% of the entire population engaged with it. Speed of change is remarkable today, all right? Now, when we introduce something new, now, arguably, we've had smartphones now for seven years. Just out of curiosity, did anybody, was anybody here a Palm user prior to 2007, Palm Trios? Yes, you're my people, thank you. I bought the first Palm device when it came out, I don't know if you remember, it had, you, you had two AAA batteries that powered it, and the batteries lasted about three weeks, then you had to replace them. Just love those devices. At any rate, so how, are we, how do we cope with change? All right, we, so as a society, we tend to deal with this stuff incrementally, all right, and we do the technology first, we see the effects of it first, and then the negative stuff that follows that, we then, government then steps in later. That's probably not a horrible approach, but it needs to be more measured, because we've seen now with the example, for example, of the example of Uber, and to a lesser extent, Airbnb, all right, is they tend to ignore whatever procedures were in place prior to them coming on the scene and pushing the envelope. Again, then society needs to respond and we do that through government. So from a management standpoint, we have the challenge of resource allocation, time and attention, and the money of decision making. We are overwhelmed with information. All right, there's way too much going out there that we don't really, figure, we, it's hard to figure out how to handle to keep up on all the things we might want to keep up on and still have some kind of a life. But technology is a complicated relationship. It can drive policy, but most policy and implementers need to get up to speed on what the tech can do. And in our government world, it's happening at different levels. For example, how many of your cities are involved in the Bloomberg What Works Cities program? Anybody? We've got a couple of you, all right? The things you're doing with, date, with big data collection and analysis would not be happening unless it was funded by a third party. And you're very fortunate that that's what's happening. But that activity of a third party is, they're getting up, they wanna get up to 100 cities in, in the country. And the fact that they're out there and learning the things they are, and it's an absolutely terrific endeavor, will help spread at other places. They're seeding this. And as, as more and more results come out about the success they have, other places are going to want to emulate that. And that's how things go out. But we also need to, to have a discussion about the implications of those things along the way. We said earlier about data, well, when data's out there, it's out there, right? What else can happen to it? And we're not having that discussion very well. Data is an incredible resource for helping us make public policy from transportation to housing to, in, to, to, to environment, little things of when street, of, you know, street light repair, when the street light goes out, having that communicated wirelessly, that's great. Helps us do that job. Uh, Boston's pothole finding app, right? People run an app, it's using the device, it uses the sensors on a smartphone that when a car hits a bad bump, it records it and sends a message that hey, there's a possible pothole here. That's cool. Places like Yelp starting to show health inspection of restaurant results, all right? Taking the data that comes from the city, from the city inspections provided through a common data format, all right? Encourages people to, to use restaurant res review results in a new way. And if you see a place that may be highly rated by people but just has a conditional result from the city, where are you gonna go with that? How are you gonna play that out? Will that encourage restaurant owners right, to improve their practices and ask for a reevaluation re sooner than they might otherwise so they can get rid of that conditional sticker on, on the Yelp site? 
What are they thinking about with that? Well, there's advantages to that. But we have to figure out how to deal with that. Part of the problem is, is that policymakers don't really understand tech, and tech people don't always understand policy. And we've got to start bringing those two groups together. Uh, we have this in schools, for example. Schools have been very good at adopting new technology, trying very hard all right, to bring in Wi-Fi, to, to enable testing online, and they've done a great job of it. They also have this area called educational technology, which is using technology for educational purposes. And you have some great educators who understand ed tech, but who don't understand tech tech. Right? And they make decisions about, okay, well, we want to adopt this new technology for our schools and for our teachers and our students. Well, now the tech person says, well, wait a minute. That's a great idea, but your system is not designed to handle that. We're going to need to upgrade A, B, C, and D in order to accommodate that tech. Now they made the decision about the tech, but they didn't think about the cost right? or what those challenges are going to bring. So we've got to figure out how to bring the policy people and the tech people to understand each other and make sure they talk to each other. In Jersey, we're starting a discussion about, well, maybe schools need to have somebody assigned to that job of integrating ed, ed tech and technology itself so people do things in an efficient, effective way. That happens with public communication as well. Right? It's very easy for governing body members to say, okay, let's put this on the website. And right? then all of a sudden, it gets down to you guys, say, you want us to do what? Now we have a new, a new problem to deal with. It may require new software, a new set of tools that you don't have. And how are, you, how are we dealing with that? In your world, knowing technology and public communications and management is a useful skill for your organizations and for people like you. Right? Finding that balance is critically important right? because you come, it comes from two different sides. And those of you who can integrate understanding the tech and understanding the policy and management skills, you're going to be highly valuable down the road. In some organizations, however, it may stay separate. Tech person, the policy person may know a little bit about tech, enough to make them dangerous and make those decisions. And the tech person may know everything you need to know about tech, but not necessarily understand the policy implications or the political implications that the decision makers have to think about. So there's some, there's some challenges there. Another challenge is the government response to the on-demand economy, all right, where people seem to want stuff now. All right, they've gotten used to it through Amazon. They can get a ride instantly through Uber or Lyft. Right? But that enabling of on-demand economy in the private sector is spilling over to the government sector. Right? How do we start to address that? When we're used to longer lags for things and all of a sudden everybody wants something now, where's that new application? Right? Well, you know, we're building it. Well, then we got to build it. We got to test it. Right? We got to deploy it. That requires some new servers, some new software. We've got to test it out. How do you educate people on it? These are some of the challenges we have to deal with there. And, and we don't do well in government when it comes to thinking about long-term impacts of things. All right? Yes, we can do short-term really well. We can try to figure out something and, well, what's the long-term implications of it? But we don't think about that so much. We don't think about the risks that are part of that very well. All right, so generational changes. There is a great speaker named Libby Spears. Uh, she spoke before GEMIS International Conference and we brought her into Jersey. And she does a great job of talking about how ge differences in, the gen in generations affect service delivery and management, the way we communicate with people. So here, these are some slides that she did. I did not do these wonderfully creative slides. But uh, we look at traditionalists. All right, mom, for example, is a traditionalist. It's less than 1% of the workforce now. However, because people are living longer, they're a significant part of your community. They're in active adult communities. They're in assisted living facilities. They're living at home, but they've got assistive programs. They're still active in part of, our, part of who we serve in government. Not so much in the workforce, though. Baby boomers, how many of us? Baby boomers? Oh, not a lot of us here. All right. 
But we're out there, some of us are delaying retirement. I'm st I technically retired, but I'm still working and expect to for a while because I can. Right? So a lot of us are doing that because one, for economic circumstances for a lot of people, they have to because of what happened in 2007. But their viewpoints of life are very different from traditionals and are different from Gen Xers. Born 19, between 1961 and 1980, from 36 and 55 years old, sort of called the sandwich generation. And I'm betting the majority of you here are Gen X. Hands, please. There you go. Look around. Can't say anything bad about MTV now. Um, because you grew up on it, right? But your viewpoints of life, having grown up the way you did, are very different from millennials. All right, how many? How many of you? I'm guessing half a dozen. No, a little bit more than that. Good. All right, 1981 to 2001, 15 years old to 35 years old, 80 million of you, half the workforce, all right? And you guys look at life very differently than people like me. All right, you grew up with different experiences. Your values were formed differently. All right, your relationships with your parents were different than mine. All right, and your expectations of life are very different from Gen X or the other folks. All right, and you're and generally speaking, and I'm not talking on any specifics. Generally speaking, your expectations of work life are different from boomers and Gen Xs. And the catch is, it's boomers and Gen Xs who make the decisions about how work works. Right? And organizations need to understand and adapt their work practices to deal with what millennials expect out of, a work, for, uh, out of work and work life. Right? And that's gonna be reinforced by Generation Z, which we don't really have a good name for right now, but uh, they're basically, I'm starting to teach them in college. And I can assure you their viewpoints and expectations are really, really different. These are the guys who have grown up digitally. They're the ones that had an iPhone or an iPad or another tablet right, put in their hands when they were two years old and they started to figure out how to use it. Right? Their expectations are really different. So one of the challenges we have to do is figure out how we manage generations in the workforce with different expectations. We are used to having single sets of rules that everybody worked with. That's gonna be a challenge as we're now bridging this transition as baby boomers leave. You know, manager doesn't have to care too much about us because we're on the way out. But Gen Xs who are in management making decisions that are affecting millennials and Gen Z coming up behind them. This is something new to organizations. We've never really had to think about it before. And it's creating all kinds of really interesting management stresses. Another thing to talk about is industry marketing and promotion as drivers of demand versus actual and perceived needs and competition for resources. How much of what you see, of what you do, is driven by vendors? Vendors coming in and selling a product. Vendors going to management and saying, hey, you need this, that you ought to be doing this. Your email box full of information from vendors. Much of it useful because that's how you get educated in a lot of the new things that are happening. They figured out how to do webinars online, right, where you can learn about a new product or service. And those things can be really useful for educational purposes, for keeping up on stuff. But how much of the demand is created by those products, right? We haven't figured that stuff out. Um, the folks at Gartner Group, uh, who do a lot of technology research, created what's called the hype cycle of technology. How many of you have you heard of the hype cycle before? Any, anybody? A couple of you heard of hype cycle. Hype cycle for technology adoption is really interesting. So at the bottom left, we have the technology trigger. That's where we've got this new thing, all right, that happened. And then everybody says, this is the greatest thing. The visibility of it is going up. This is the greatest new thing, and it's going to do all these new things, and everybody needs to do it now. And we hit the peak of inflated expectations, and then everybody finds, you know, version 1.0 of that wasn't so good. It was more challenging to do than we thought. And all of a sudden, it drops down, and this is time over here, into the trough of disillusionment, where it sounded great, but now it's not so good. And then they finally get their act together, version 2.0. And 3.0 start to come out. 
And now people are saying, oh, you know, this is not so bad. Now we can figure out how to make it work. It integrates well with all our other services now. And now it becomes the plateau of productivity, and you move forward. We spend an enormous amount of time and attention here. This is where all the media hype is. This is where the news cycle is, right? Because once you hit here, yeah, nobody really cares anymore. And then it becomes very quiet, so now you figured it out, and now you're able to move up with it, right? And that's an important element, and keep that in mind when you read about new technologies, and somebody's coming and say, hey, we've got the next big thing for you, all right? Well, understand that there's going to be this slope, and it's remarkably prescient about how it works. Right? Think back about new technologies that you've had to implement and see how that actually applied to it. It's, it's really good. We're also challenged by a venture capital model that underwrites full costs of a service and basically provides discounts on a current level until later runs into challenges when, expo when, exposes, when exposed to the market. Right? There's going to be a shakeout of some kind on transportation network services, the thing we used to call ride sharing. Every time you take an Uber or a Lyft ride, there's venture capital that is subsidizing the cost of that ride to you. You don't pay the full price. It is subsidized. Capital, venture capitalists think that over time the model will settle out and then they'll be able to start getting money back, but prices will have to go up. Right? Well, what happens when prices go up? What's going to be the impact on the market? Uh, will, there be, will people still continue using them at the rate they are, or will it become so embedded that the prices can go up 15, 20, or 30 percent and people will still pay the bill? There's going to be something happening on that. Right? We don't quite know how. Right? We've seen the issue with Airbnb when they ran into regulatory problems, and the unintended consequence of people who own apartments or condominiums renting them out. Instead of renting them out to tenants on a full year or multiple year lease, they basically put them on Airbnb or VDRO on a full time basis. They make more money that way, but it's taking housing off the market in places where housing is needed. Public policy issue nobody saw coming. And now the companies are trying to deal with that, and cities are trying to regulate that business so that those housing units are used for housing purposes and not just for short-term rentals. Nobody quite thought about that, has thought about that stuff very well over time, and we're not really good at it. So, so let's talk about cybersecurity here. Um, several ways cyber attackers can harm your organization. Exposure of data, corruption of data, disruption of operations, and extortion. Security means, at the bottom level, is keeping up with the bad guys. You're just keeping up, because you're never going to get ahead. All right? You will not get ahead of the security guys. Verizon, in its recent data breach investigation report, made four really interesting points. Say, no one thinks they're going to be the one that's hit, until it is. Organizations think they've got the basics covered. However, last year, Around 1 in 14 users were tricked into following a link of, or opening an attachment, all right? And a quarter of those went on to be duped more than once. That's the cyber hygiene problem. People are still failing to set strong passwords. 80% of hacking-related breaches leveraged either stolen passwords or weak or guessable passwords. And I'm going to assume that's not a problem in this room, that nobody's going to have a, a login and password that says admin, admin. All right? All right? You're going to do passphrases. You're going to throw in some capital letters and some symbols here and there. All right? I once did, I just, a couple months ago, I did an expert report that included a scenario in a, in a Barracuda installation in the police department where they had four sys admins. All right? And they all were able to access the Barracuda email product with the same ID and password. So individuals could go in. And there's no accountability of who was going in at what time and looking at what stuff. They just used a single admin and password. Admin, password for the device. Four people using it. Not a good idea. 
The fourth point in the Verizon report is that people rely on, on how they've always done things because nothing necessarily bad happened to them, but they keep on doing it anyway. And that's a really interesting little problem. FireEye is a little bit long, but I'll read it because I know I'm starting to run out of time. Uh, most organizations are aware of and have plans to address their financial, legal, and insurance risks. But what about cyber risks? We live in an era where a month doesn't go by without another major data breach in the news. Yet these high-profile cyber attacks represent only publicly reported incidents. Many breaches never make it into the media. Every organization today has an exposure to such risks. And if cyber risk isn't a government-level discussion now, it will be when your organization experiences a significant breach. We've had this happen. It's happened in organizations all across the country, from ransomware to just folks getting on the network and figuring out how to shut it down or exfiltrate data. Department of Homeland Security recently said cybersecurity is not simply about making a checklist of requirements. Rather, it is managing cyber risks to an acceptable level. You're never going to get ahead of the bad guy. Question, how many of do you think your organization is doing, this, based on what you've heard me talk about, an adequate job of managing its cybersecurity? How many of you? That's a disappointing number. All right, it's about maybe 40% of you. All right, your organizations need to spend time and attention on this. And it's not just time and attention, because that's going to result in needing to spend money on it. And that's a challenge that we clearly have to deal with. All right, I think one other thing I want to mention here. Um, when it comes to government adoption of, of these practices, we have challenges. Government doesn't, as you, you all see, deal with all of these things very well. There are political challenges. There are issues of citizen expectations that have to be managed. Challenges when it comes to transparency, because I assure you that most political people think transparency is good for the other guy, but not so much for me. All right, it's like taxes. You know, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the guy behind the tree. All right, for when it comes to transparencies, officials are not necessarily keen on it as it affects themselves. Service delivery challenges. Service del changes in service delivery often cost more money. Where's that money to pay for it coming from? Social media issues, trolling, and then trolling by political competitors. A lot of trolls basically are there to in in influence a political process. Right? How that happens, how that works is something that is evolving constantly, but it's a challenge that they need to think about. We don't allow ourselves a lot of time to absorb changes before something else happens. We, have, we just, adopt, okay, here's a new thing we want to do. We're going to spend a couple months adopting it. We get it in place, and all of a sudden, it's changed. There's something newer now that we have to deal with. The pace of technological changes often outstrips our ability to, in, to bring those changes into the organization, put them through, and get people used to them before we got to do something new. That is a societal issue. And also, we wound up with government officials being compared to what's happening in the private sector, where the motivations and dynamics are very different. I used to say government used to be about five years behind, the, behind new adoptions in the private sector. All right? It would take five years for something innovative in the private sector to filter its way into government practice on a regular basis. I think that's changing. It's probably down to three years now. And that adds real stress on government organizations to try to figure out how do we manage all these new things. How do we manage these changes? So, let's see here, what else we got? So, my last point before we're done here today. You are all public administrators of one kind or another, and I do a lot of training of public administrators. I don't use the term public servant because, frankly, we're administrators, we have a job to do. Um, I work with a certified public manager program in, 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 in Jersey. And there's a whole lot of, there's books, dozens of books on how to manage in the public sector. But I ran into this notion, I kind of paraphrased it, that there's really five key things you want to be able to do. And I think they all will help you if you think about them. The first is consider all issues when dealing with whatever challenge you are dealing with. And then think about the risks that will help you determine what, what to focus on next. Communicate with all parties who have interests. Don't exclude interested parties. Bring them to the table. Ha let them have some kind of a say. Make sure they get heard. 
And that includes other people in your organization as well. Look at all the alternatives, both inside and outside the box, and evaluate them based on the criteria of the exercise. All right, you know, what are you trying to do? Have some evaluation criteria. Understand the risks that are involved. And finally, you know, don't ignore the risks and consider the long term. All right, you know, if you're going to present a report to decision makers because you're not going to make that decision, make sure you make the risks clear. Consider the long term. Right? The decision may not come back the way you want it to, but at the same time, you will have done your best to inform your management of here's the things you need to think about, and here's what I've concluded, what I've, what I've concluded because I thought about these things. These five things are like the core of being a competent manager. So think about that. So with that, um, I want to tell you just about a couple other things that I work on. This is that technology risk stuff. Um, I'll tell you how to, if you're interested in this stuff. It's about two years old now. Um, it's, it's still pretty good. I, I'd probably change some stuff if I, had a, if I had to update it. But this thing on the left here is just a report about technology risks and what those risks are. This is a supplement that breaks technology organizations down into a basic, core, managed, and sophisticated level. And it has best practices and resources for different sizes of, of organization. Said, but two years old now, I'd probably update it and refresh some stuff because some, some things have changed, but it's, it's probably a very good starting tool. This document's also online, which I'll show you how to get. This is a uh, kind of a summary of the other two. It's written in 16-point type with a lot of graphics. So it's designed for elected officials and managers. This is a two-page version of the whole thing, which you can also download, which summarizes a whole lot of this stuff. Um, tech proficiency is a new project I'm working on. Uh, we have a lot of standards out there, a lot of frameworks on how to manage your, your technology, the things you should do and things you should watch for. Um, you got the NIST standards, there's ISACA standards, there's ISO standards. Um, I kind of took all these things and dealing with the notion of tech proficiency, um, of competency, hygiene, and management, developed a minimum model of technology. It's mostly for smaller organizations. Um, it's not out yet, it's gonna be out later, it's gonna be out in October, uh, but it's the minimum amount of things you should do just to protect your butt, all right? So you can recover from disaster. All right, it's the minimum amount of things you can do, and, and not a lot of folks talk about that because nobody really wants to say, well, because if you say there's a minimum, that's what people will just do and stop. But I would argue there's a lot of government organizations, not in this room, there's still a lot of organizations out there that are below minimums and put themselves at extreme risk. All right, so we got that. The wrap up. I have no simple solutions, but I've suggested some things for you to think about. And we need to pay attention to these things so we can get positive outcomes on them. We are seeing a revolution in, in how government gets things done. It is arguably equal to the introduction of electricity or the automobile. There is nothing less at stake, there's nothing at stake less than the ongoing ability of government to hold the confidence of the public when it comes to dealing with the issues that society counts on for government to manage and services they deliver. It will take the re efforts of public employees, each with their own tasks and responsibilities, regardless of function or place in their organization, to do their job in this new environment. It is infused with technological tools that change the way people live, learn, and work, and for us, how we deliver those services they've entrusted us to deliver. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope this was useful to you. Tom. Thank you. If, if you are interested in any of that other stuff I was talking about, the best way to find it, just do a search in your, brow, in your web, web search of choice to, for Blaustein Technology Risk. It should come right up to our homepage. Can I answer any, do we have time for some questions at this point? Anybody some questions or comments on this? I, I would love the feedback. This is the first time I've done this show. I'm gonna tweak it now because I now had an audience to do it for and I can see some things, but. You, I know, I know, I am standing between you and the giveaways. I get that. <laughs> All right? And seeing none, I thank you again. I, have, I hope you have a safe trip home, back to your homes, and do well. Thank you. Leslie, you're up. <laughs>